Before we begin, I would also like to add a trigger warning for anyone who is sensitive to certain topics. Please take care when you're watching this video. Pause it, take a breath if you need to, or we will add timestamps so that you can skip around and skip over the parts that you may not be comfortable hearing or watching. And to have to sit there and show no emotion and listen to my children tell me what happened to them by him and by their uncle was, there's no words for that. Yeah. Watching my children try to process the cognitive dissonance of this is their dad that they loved and yet what he'd done to them, the atrocity of what he'd done to them was so hard to watch. And there wasn't even time for me to process cognitive dissonance that I had, having been married to someone who wasn't even who I thought he was. Hey, my name is Shalise Ansola, and this is Cults to Consciousness, where we discuss leaving high demand religions or organizations and finding healing and independence through awareness and true individual sovereignty. As always, if you're only listening and you want to see our faces, you can head on over to our YouTube channel at Cults to Consciousness, where you can join in on the conversation, become an advocate, a subscriber, um, telling us that you want to support these people who are coming forward and sharing their stories. It really helps out. It helps the algorithm and it obviously provides support for our guests. So today's guest, I found her, she was actually a suggestion from one of you guys, which led us down this entire rabbit hole from Sins of the Amish. It is a documentary, you can find it on Peacock, and it is this heart-wrenching, heartbreaking documentary, and our guest today was actually featured on that, and so I'm just really excited to get into her story. Thank you so much for joining us, Audrey Kaufman. It's nice to be here. Yeah, there's so much that we have to talk about. Just off camera, you were saying, I could go for days, there's so much to talk about, so it's gonna be hard to kind of narrow it down. But I think what we really wanna focus on today are the things that most people don't understand or haven't up until this point of our series about the Amish, about the things that go on behind closed doors, the things that people can get away with, and what is happening within these communities that is so damaging and ultimately cult-like. When we talk about the Amish in this interview, we are speaking about your specific experience because we know that there are different rules and and things for each Amish community. So when it comes to your story, I guess we can start at the beginning and talk about how you converted into becoming Amish. So for me, my parents transitioned in when I was younger. And so when I go, going back to my childhood is pretty important because it lays the foundation for a later part of my story. But I was born to, I, I like to describe as two pot smoking hippies. <laughs> And grew up in a home that was very dysfunctional. My mom started attending church when I was four. And my dad later when I was six. My mom started to homeschool us. I was the oldest, ended up being the oldest of 12. Wow. At first, it was just my brother and I for several years. So they had the perfect American family. And then later decided to have more children. So I was homeschooled my whole life. And when I was about 14 was when some of the biggest changes started to happen. In between that time frame, we were Baptist churches of all types and varieties. So my mom started attending the Baptist church when I was about four. And after she started to homeschool us, they started to hop churches. And so my childhood was filled with just hopping churches, church splits, home churching, a variety, so much variety. And then German Baptists, and then the horse and buggy German Baptists, so the old order. And then they found Cookville, Tennessee, the home of the Christian communities started by Elmo Stoll out of Elmer, Ontario. And that was when the biggest changes in my life started to happen. So here I am, 14, thinking in another year, I'm going to be driving. Mm -hmm. And 
my parents decided to just flip my world upside down, sell everything we have, put our piano in the ravine. I was a pretty accomplished pianist at this point, played in church, sang in the choir, and they just flipped it all upside down and decided we're going to throw away everything that we have. We're going to buy a wood cook stove, kerosene lamps, start making all our own clothing, and we're going to move to Tennessee. Wow, that is a huge shift, clearly. I can't even imagine what you must have felt like as a teenager because that's already such a hard time in someone's life and adapting to new hormones and figuring out what you like and what you don't like. And then you are just put into this really intense situation of no electricity and no musical instruments, right? That's part Mm -hmm. of the Amish rules, no musical instruments. What's going through your mind as a teenager? I was really angry, really confused, really angry. There wasn't conversation about, you know, we did my parents didn't have a relationship with us. So it wasn't like we had conversation. How do you feel about this? You know, there was no conversation around. It was just what they decided to do. So when I moved from Indiana to Tennessee at 15, I was an angry teenager that just was like, as soon as my first chance, I'm going back and I'm going to college. My dream at that point was to be a nurse or an airline stewardess, something along those lines. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a huge change. And I'm trying to imagine what it was like for 12 children, you said, 12 children to all of a sudden be put into this lifestyle. Yeah, there wasn't 12 at that point. I think there was six of us at that point. But yeah. Okay. Yeah, my mom stopped going to the doctor. Like we didn't no longer went to the doctor for anything. And she stopped seeing her gynecologist. And so I was at 14 helping to deliver her babies. Oh my gosh. And not very happy about it. That must have been really terrifying for you. And I'm just trying to picture going from all of these, what we would call modern day conveniences to none of them and having to make your own clothes. I mean, I'm a seamstress. I have a degree in fashion. I know how long it takes to make something. It's not an easy thing. And these dresses that I have seen, and maybe you can describe the dresses that you had to wear, are usually pretty... There's a lot to them. And I imagine it would take quite a long time just to make one. And so what was that transition like? Did you have to learn how to sew? Were you in charge of making your own clothes or were you able to purchase them from other local families? No, there was definitely no purchasing of them. I had to learn how to sew. It was a crash course of learning how to sew, learning how to make our own bread, canning, because we no longer had freezers. And when we moved into the community, the house wasn't even finished. The basement was not even completely dug out. Whoa! It was steps that went down to a red hole. And no plumbing. We had an outhouse, no running water, all our water. We had to carry our water in five gallon pails up the hill about 50 yards from a spring. And later we connected, put in, installed a hydraulic ram and pumped it up into a cistern that we dug out and built. To water our greenhouses, we would take the trailer, the the team and the trailer down to the creek and fill 55 gallon drums of water and haul them up to the greenhouses, and that's how we watered things. So I went from all the conveniences to primitive. We didn't even have a way to mow our grass. I used a sigh. So I learned a lot of things, and I became very resourceful very quickly. Sure. One of the things that I learned quickly was that if I was going to fit in, I was going to have to learn to do everything well. Hmm. It included learning the language, right, and especially clothing, cooking, hosting crowds. I didn't know how to do any of this. We washed all our laundry with a James Way washer. What is that like? So it was like it was like a half barrel, like a half drum with a beater in the bottom and you just back and forth 300 strokes per load of laundry, fed it through a hand crank wringer into a tub, rinsed it by hand, put it back through the wringer, hang it on the clothesline. I had to learn a whole new lifestyle skill set language, culture, I would often sit up till the wee hours in the morning sewing clothes because I was determined that we were going to fit in and we weren't going to be the weirdos because we were the weirdos when we moved in. Interesting. You were considered weird because you didn't know how to do all of these things that they were already doing within their homes. Yeah. I mean, it was a whole other culture. I mean, it'd be like moving to Italy and trying to adapt. Yeah, that makes sense. 
Did you ever push back with your parents? Were, did, you said you didn't have that type of relationship where you could really communicate your wants and needs. I'm just picturing, though, a 14-year-old, the oldest, being like, um, hell no. What are we doing? Why are you doing this to us? This is awful. What were you thinking? At that point in my life, I didn't even know having an opinion was an option. Oh. My dad always said, my dad's motto was, don't let the door hit you on the way out. And I never had an opinion growing up, really. I didn't know that that was an option. And if we attempted to have one, he did it out of us really quickly. It was normal to just be sitting at the table eating while he and my mom were having a conversation, overhearing the conversation and apparently having a facial expression of some type and just being knocked off backward off your chair suddenly and not even knowing why you got hit. Oh. We never, we didn't speak up because it wasn't, it just wasn't an option. Got it. So growing up that way set the stage for the brainwashing and the gaslighting and Mm. everything that came down the pike for me later. Yeah. And I'm glad that you brought that up. I think that's really important to discuss. And it makes total sense how you kind of seamlessly slipped into this new lifestyle, not realizing that you could fight back or not having the option to fight back. It's just, this is your world now. And we see that all the time with people who are raised in high demand groups. Yes, they understand that they aren't happy with something and something is off, but they don't really know any different and they don't know that they have an option to have something better or happier or less abusive. So, okay. We set the stage for your childhood. Is there anything that you want to discuss within your adolescent years before you got married? I think it's important to talk about the fact that I was raped as an adolescent because that and the way the culture handled that was a huge piece going forward into the rest of my life. Mm. So yeah, at first, you know, moving in to this whole new world, I was angry, confused overwhelmed, but I was determined I'm going to make this work. I was going to make the best of it. And then when the time came, I would leave. But with time, I made friends and I grew to love it and became very brainwashed to the point that I believed that if you didn't live there and you weren't part of the church, you weren't going to go to heaven. I swallowed it hook, line and sinker. And so I transitioned pretty seamlessly into the culture as much as possible. My parents never allowed me to like go to the youth functions, hang out with other people. Like I was always, you know, with them supervised. They were utter control freaks. So I didn't get to experience the fun side of that life Mm -hmm. very much, but I do have a few memories here and there where that were, that were really good. However, when I was 17, I was groomed and by one by the 35 year old church member. He was from Canada. You have to understand with my limited knowledge, you know, at this point, I don't even understand that body parts have names. Wow. Okay. I'm 17 and don't even understand. You know, when I first got my period, I thought I was bleeding to death. I did not know anything about female body function. And, you know, my mom cracked the bathroom door, threw a bra in on the floor and said, here, put this on. I was supposed to figure it out. You know, when I started with my period, my dad's like, you've got something on the back of the dress of your dress. You need to go to the bathroom and see what it is. And I'm like thinking I'm bleeding to death. Oh, my gosh. No one ever explained this to me. Right. So I was a perfect target. Perfect target for someone to groom. Yeah. However, with the culture, in that culture, a woman is always responsible for what happens to her, always. And here I am at 17, suddenly responsible for the fact that a 35-year-old man raped me and then fled back to Canada. Mm. My, my dad beat me over 30 times when I, I mean, I was terrified. So I'm thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to end up pregnant. When he told me he had had a vasectomy, I didn't know what that meant. Mm. In my head, I'm terrified. So 
I go to the bishop because the bishop's family was like my second family. I trusted them. I go to them. I tell them what happens. I say, I can't tell my parents. They're going to kill me. And they're like, oh, no, you know, we think your parents will understand. We can't keep this a secret. We have to tell them. So we go back late at night to tell my parents. And, of course, my dad was Mr. Nice Guy while they were there. But after they left, he beat me. Oh. But the reason this is important is because no one reported anything. I didn't understand that I'd been raped. I was labeled as a whore. No. The church girls were no longer allowed to talk to me. They weren't allowed to speak to me at church. I wasn't allowed to go anywhere, do anything, see anyone. The shame, the shame was indescribable for a 17-year-old. Mm-hmm. And from then on, I was just marked. I was a whore who was going to seduce all these people's sons. And it went, followed me from one community to the next. And I internalized that. And my fa- with my father's abuse, I mean, I grew up with my father making fun of my body and saying I had a fat butt and telling me that I just laughed for attention and all these different things. Uh. So growing up with that... And then this on top of it. And so not only is my father telling me there's something wrong with me, now the culture's telling me there's something wrong with me, but I had no basis. I had no basis to underta- untangle it or to even understand that there was something wrong with it. Right. So I internalized it. So moving forward into my life, I was a perfect target for the man that I married. And I'd like to take a pause real quick and add a little bit more context for people who aren't familiar with the Amish lifestyle. There are so many things in place that are supposed to save a man's impure thoughts. The way that you dress, you have to do all of these different things and and all these rules. And maybe you could speak to a few of them that are supposed to keep the men pure. And that's why when something like that happens, you are supposed to you're considered the one who enticed him, who drew that in because clearly you are doing something wrong that aroused the man. And that's why they're blaming the women. It's so disgusting and backwards and uh, makes my blood boil. And it's just it's so aggravating and wrong. And I I look back now and, you know, now it's, it's almost humorous because it's so twisted, so backwards. But, you know, here. okay, so at 17, my dress, my this our skirts were required to have 120 inches of fabric. Whoa. At the waist. They were supposed to cover the ankle bone. Next had to have a high collar. We had to have long sleeves. We were not allowed to wear short sleeves or push them up past our elbows. Our coverings, if we didn't wear a long hanging veil that covered the back of our neck, we had to have a flap on the bottom of our covering that came down over the collar of our dress. No skin showing, right? Some of us, myself included, were required to wear what we were, what they called a smock. So it was this long flowy top over the top of our dress that women generally was generally reserved for pregnancy. Tell me how a 17 year old is responsible for a man's purity when she's covered from head to toe, has no concept of what sex even is or her own sexuality, period. Mm -hmm. It doesn't make any sense. The part two that drives me crazy is it doesn't matter what women are wearing. Rapists are going to. That's just end of story. That shouldn't even be a thought of, well, what was she wearing? It doesn't matter. Whatever I put on my body does not invite or disinvite you to touch it without my permission. Mm -hmm. So even just the whole, quote, modesty thing I have such issue with, and I have no problem with people dressing the way that they choose to dress Mm -hmm. because it makes them feel a certain way. It's when it's forced on them and the shame that comes with that and these faux responsibilities that comes with that, that's what I'm not okay with. Mm -hmm. There's just so many layers to it that clearly create damaging effects and gives these men a free pass when they're 100% capable of controlling themselves. Exactly. And, you know, we weren't allowed to make eye contact. We weren't supposed to be making eye contact with men. And 
Jeez. Certainly not laughing. And so, you know, as I'm entering adulthood, you know, I'm walking around with my eyes down, so self-conscious of my laugh, so conscious of my body, every move that I make. Can you describe what it was like in your community around dating and like the lack of dating or if there was or if there was courtship and how that worked and how you eventually met your husband? So each community kind of has its own way of, of the whole dating courtship thing. So the communities that I was part of would have followed the courtship angle. There was a heavy, you know, Bill Gothard, Michael and Debbie Pearl influence. There was no such thing as dating. I met my husband, my ex-husband, when I moved, I moved from Tennessee to North Carolina after my dad kicked me out. So at 18, my parents decided they're done with this. They're going to leave. They can't get along. I mean, let's be real. Who could get along with my dad? Nobody. But they left the community and I wanted to stay. And so my dad kicked me out. The bishop at the time sent me to North Carolina to a New Order Amish church. I transitioned from outhouses and kerosene lamps and no running water to electricity in the homes, phones in the homes, mm. tractors for farming, but not transportation, horse and buggies and bicycles. So this was like a huge step up, a whole new culture now to learn. Yeah. It was in this community that I met my ex-husband. But this community also operated much the same. Their theology was much the same. And so there was no dating. It was courtship. There was a heavy Bill Gothard and Michael and Debbie Pearl influence already at that time. And a lot of families that had come in from what they would have called the outside. Those families brought their own unique piece because you have these people coming out of the Amish who are idealistic, and then you have people coming in from the outside who are idealistic, and you put those two, two together, and it's a whole dynamic. When we courted, we were allowed one phone call a month, one letter a month, and one date a month. The date consisted of him bringing me home from church and basically sitting on opposite ends of the couch to have a devotional period. And then we were supposed to talk about <laughs> I don't know, because it was so awkward. Like you can't get to know somebody like that. It was so awkward. We were never allowed to go do anything, take any walks, go anywhere. A lot of Amish communities, you know, the boys will take the girls back and forth to the singing. They'll, you know, do different things. You know, we were never allowed to do any of that. In those communities, when you don't live at home with your parents, you're expected to live under another man. So with another family under his authority, there's no freedom for single women. So when my ex-husband wanted to court me, he came to the family that I was living with, expressed that they came to me and I was supposed to pray about it for three days. So I did. And I said, yes. I mean, I, I mean, I didn't really know that, you know, there was another option because being single in that world certainly wasn't an option. I mean, you get married and you have babies. That's what you do. That's the ultimate. That's the utopia. Ladies, girls who didn't get married were looked down on subclass. So we started dating and we dated for a few months and there was a lot of drama. The family that I lived with was very toxic, very unhealthy. There was a lot of drama, a lot of jealousy. Our courtship was a living nightmare. In the end, we were forced to break up for five months but we were required to be married within six months of courtship. Was that a community rule? It was a community rule because long drawn out courtships were considered inappropriate and temptation for impurity. Got it. So of course we would have never touched, would have never held hands, never kissed, anything like that. So once we got back together, we were married shortly thereafter and the wedding was held in similar fashion. The whole community, because I didn't have a father, had to have a brother's meeting to decide how my wedding was going to go, how <sighs> we weren't like a lot of the other communities would have paired boys and girls together to be servers, to wait the tables of guests for the meal that was served after the ceremony. 
And we weren't allowed to do that. They had to all be girls. Why is that? If you pair boys and girls up, you might put ideas into their heads that are inappropriate. My goodness. The extent of which they try to keep boys and girls apart and men and women apart is just, it's a lot. Yeah. And when we would have singings, the boys sat on one side of the table and the girls sat on the other. There was very little, very, very few opportunities to mix. At this point, now that you're 18, have you learned more about sex from your peers, even though it's not really talked about and no one formally teaches you about it? Because I'm wondering if you or those around you, uh, your friends, ever had the experience of because you're so separated, you want to have that experience. Maybe you don't even realize that sex is supposed to be pleasurable. And so you're not looking forward to getting married. Were people excited to get married to have sex? Or did they even know that that was a thing that could be good, could be good? We never talked about it. It was a taboo subject. There was no conversation around sex and marriage until you got married. Okay. And then the ministers came and sat down with you after you were married, after you'd had lunch. They came and sat with us and explained in very vague terms how a woman is supposed to please her husband. It was probably the most awkward meeting I'd had in my lifetime. Yeah, I was just going to say that sounds incredibly awkward. Do you remember any of the things they told you specifically? No, I pretty much shut down. <laughs> right. I pretty much shut down. That was that was very traumatic. Because in a culture where there is no conversation around it to begin with, and then men sit you down to have this conversation. Yeah. And coming from your past traumas, I'm sure that was really triggering. Yeah. And at one point on our wedding day, we were holding hands and a minister came up to us and took us aside and told us that we're not allowed to hold hands because it's going to create impure thoughts for the other young people that are there. Oh my goodness gracious. It, it never ends. <laughs> no. What was going through your mind then when now that you kind of know what your spousal duty is, your wifely duty to your husband, are you expected to consummate that night? Is there any sort of ritualistic thing in the Amish specifically that you have to do for the marriage? I can't say that there was anything ritualistic expected. Um, but yeah, you were expected to consummate it that night. The anxiety around having sex was so high it wasn't even possible mm, on both of your parts but i'm assuming specifically on his part yeah i felt like there was something wrong with me right while women are responsible for men's purity they're also responsible for their satisfaction of course and it doesn't make sense two sides of the same coin mm -hmm. do you feel like your ex-husband blamed you for that night? I don't even know because we never ever had conversation about it. Mm. Even though we were married and there was a whole stack of books shoved at us, titles that we should read, it wasn't something we ever had conversation about. Because it's so taboo. It's so taboo. It was just something that I was expected to endure and he rolled over and went to sleep. I never even had an orgasm until after my divorce. Mm. And I had five children. Wow. Yeah, it makes sense when there's no education around it, especially when no one tells you that it can be pleasurable for the woman. I didn't realize women could masturbate until I was like 17, 18. <laughs> I didn't even know it was a thing because it was never talked about in Mormonism. It was just always about the men and what they're doing and pleasing the men. So it totally makes sense. So... At what point did you feel you weren't in a good place with your marriage? Because you did say that it was an abusive marriage. How soon did that come out? The emotional abuse, the gaslighting, it was always there from the beginning. I just didn't recognize it. Mm. And then, you know, I was just, I was on this quest to be the best wife that I could be. I was going to do it like I had done everything else. I had learned the language. I was an excellent seamstress. I sewed for a living. Mm. You know, I, I could can. I could bake beautiful bread. I could host large groups of people seamlessly. And so I was, 
I was going to be the best wife I could possibly be. I'm in my dream, my dream world, right? My kids are going to grow up with all the things I didn't have. They're going to have family. They're going to have community. They're going to have friends. It's going to be stable. So as things started to deteriorate in our marriage, I instinctively assumed it was my responsibility. And I literally had box had boxes, banana boxes, like five banana boxes of books on marriage, relationships, intimacy that I accumulated over the years in my quest to be the best and to fix what was broken. It wasn't until about 11 years in that I started to realize that something was wrong. And he would, he would come to me randomly and be like, I'm sorry, I need to confess something to you. I was talking to another woman or I was messaging another woman, but he would never elaborate. And so I was so naive, I had no context for that, right? So in my small box, I had no idea what, he, what that meant. I didn't know what that was code for. And so I didn't even know to question it, right? So in, instantly, my first response was, I'm so sorry, what am I not giving you? What can I do differently? Oh, no. That was my instinctive response. Because I was so programmed that this was my responsibility. It was my job to fix this. It must be something I'm doing wrong. There's something inherently broken inside me that's causing him to act out. Right. I didn't realize that I wasn't responsible for his behavior and it had nothing to do with me. So I just tried harder and harder and harder and harder. Mentally, as I was having more children, carrying all the stress was becoming almost too much for me. And at one point I started taking antidepressants that my doctor gave me, which was a huge no-no, but I had to do something because I wasn't okay. And then his dad, shamed me and told me that my spiritual life isn't where it needs to be because if I was truly connected to God, I wouldn't be depressed and I wouldn't need medication. Oh my gosh. But he'll give me a pass because, you know, coming from where I come from, he can understand that it's probably just something that I need to, I need to work on. That is so dangerous. When you have someone who truly needs help, whether it's a trauma that's trying to surface, whether it's you actually have a chemical imbalance that needs to be balanced and you're telling them it's their fault, that's not okay. Later down the road, we moved out of that community and moved back to Pennsylvania, which would have been where my ex-husband would have been born. It's where his family would have come from, from the old order Amish up here. That was kind of a chance for me to breathe because his dad was, is extremely emotionally abusive. He was also the bishop Mm. and he would ream me out and rant at me for hours on end. And I would just freeze. My whole body would, I would just completely disassociate my whole body. I wouldn't even be able to feel my body. There would just be nothingness and i would hear him talking at me but i couldn't i couldn't even connect anymore and one time after one of those sessions i remember asking my ex-husband i was like why do you let him do this to me you know the things he says aren't true and he was like well he's my dad what do you expect me to do right and his dad knew he was cheating his dad knew he was sneaking around his dad knew he was going to hooters really he knew all this stuff and later down the road, when we, when things started to come out, his crime started to come to light and I found his journals and I realized that he had been doing acting out and masturbating and had assaulted his cousins as a child. And his dad knew all of this stuff <sighs> and had never done anything. 
he always covered it up every time. And I one time I'll never forget, he went to Hooters. I didn't find it out. I, the only reason I found it out is because his dad, he had borrowed his dad's GPS and I guess forgot to, he was very good at covering his tracks, but I guess that time he forgot to clear his history. And so his dad found out he went to Hooters. And so normally in a situation like that, he would have been forced to go in front of the church and confess and apologize and mm-hmm. yada, yada. But his dad said, you know, I'll let it go this time because I don't, this would really hurt your mom and I don't want to hurt her. So he always found some way to cover for his son. And I hold him very responsible for where his son is today and for everything that happened. Yeah. And I think one of the major reasons that I wanted to bring you on, aside from telling your personal story, is because we haven't had the perspective of a mother who stood up for their children. And so if you're comfortable talking about it, I'd I'd like to get into what it was like as a mom watching these things happen to your girls and how you were able to stand up for them. Well... So after we moved back to Pennsylvania, he, my ex-husband now had technology. He had a lot more access, a lot more freedom, little to no accountability. I was still very naive. I had no clue. And my girls, my oldest one started cutting and my second oldest was extremely depressed and became so and I didn't understand why I was grasping I would beg God to show me you what's going on here yeah I thought at the time that it was just from the tension in our marriage I just figured they knew more than what I thought they did Mm mm-hmm And that that was where it was coming from. I had no idea, no idea what was really going on behind the scenes. One day, one of my daughters came to me and just asked me very carefully and cautiously if it's normal for a dad to walk up behind her and grab her ass. And I was just speechless because I was my brain was going 90 miles a minute. I'm like, why, well, why is she even, where has she heard this, seen this? What's she been exposed to? Like they were so sheltered. There's no way they could have thought that up or experienced that. There's no way they could have been exposed to something like that. They hadn't been exposed to anything like that. So there's, I, I knew right away something had happened and more had happened than what I realized. But I also knew that I had to be very, very careful. At this point, I had found out that he was involved in porn chat rooms, had been with multiple women, that he was having sex with animals. Whoa. Like I knew all this. I wasn't prepared. Never had questioned the fact that he would have been raping my children. (sighs) When my daughter went into the mental hospital, was when I realized that she had two uncles that had raped her. Mm. And the abuse from his youngest brother on all three of my oldest children was incomprehensible. No child his age could even, they can't even think that or make that up. So clearly he was experiencing it as well. So first I found out about the uncles. And in the meantime, I had separated from my ex-husband because of his infidelity. So the church has excommunicated me. His parents are trying to get custody of my children to take them away from me because I left my ex. Mm. So there's all these pieces. I'm trying to learn, figure out how to get a real job, how to make a living, how to establish a bank account how to buy a car. Like I didn't know how to do any of this stuff. Yeah. So there's so many moving pieces. I was still homeschooling my children. 
So when my daughter came to me with this, I knew there was more that I didn't know. And I called a really close friend who had worked with abuse situations for years. And I said, I asked her, I said, what do I do? I said, what do I do? And she was like, you have to report it. I said, I know, but if I, I don't know how much there is to report. Like, what if they don't do anything because they don't think it's serious enough? I'm going to lose my kids. I knew what he would do. I knew he would retaliate and he would come after the children and be the first thing he would do. And she was like, Audrey, if you don't report it, the state's going to take him away from you if they find out. Right. It was one of the most terrifying things I've ever done in my lifetime because we've been taught, it was ingrained into us, that children and youth, and the police, law enforcement, everyone was there waiting for an excuse to take our kids away from us. I, I was between a rock and a hard place. I was either going to lose them to him or I was going to lose them to the law. Like, and I figured, I figured the best, I, I'd rather fall into the hands of the law than to have him get them. Yeah, of course. And it began, it began a three year process that I never in my wildest dreams imagined. And as my children started to talk, as my daughter started to talk, my other children started to open up. I can't tell you what it's like to sit beside the bed of your child who wants to die and has tried every way possible to die <clears throat> that you've had to watch 24-7 for two and a half years to keep her alive and listen to her tell you what her father did to her when this is the person that you trusted with your very life that you created these babies with as messed up as the whole picture was I was still married to him I still in my own twisted way thought I loved him <clears throat> and to have to sit there and show no emotion and listen to my children tell me what happened to them by him and by their uncle was, there's no words for that. Yeah. And then to not know if I can even keep them safe. I'm very grateful. <clears throat> the state trooper that they put on our case was phenomenal he was phenomenal my experiences with children and youth in this county were phenomenal the lengths that his family and the community went to to try to destroy me and try to silence us were incredible his dad would write me letters in the beginning and tell me you know how I'm going to go to hell and how I'm digging a pit for other people. And you, know, you quote Bible verses at me, you know, the ones in Proverbs about how, you know, when you dig a pit for others, you know, you're going to fall into it yourself. And <clears throat> he would call me and harass me. They tried hacking my computer, my phone. Um, those were just the, you know, the preliminary early steps. And in one of the phone conversations with his father, I straight up confronted him and I said, you know, I said, I know that you picked at least three of your sisters as a teenager. They told me. I said, so it's no wonder that your sons don't see anything wrong with what they've done. Yeah. And you know what his response was to me? This is a bishop. He said, well, you have to understand. My sisters always had their dresses on. So that wasn't fornication. Oh, my God. <sighs> And that was the last conversation I had with him. I told him I don't ever want to speak to him again and that he makes me sick. So after that was when he started writing me letters. And he, he, he just wouldn't stop harassing me. And so I became the first Amish woman that I'm aware of to press charges against an Amish bishop. And they stuck. And at the hearing, he stood across the parking lot and told me that he forgives me and that he loves me. <sighs> That he forgives you. Mm -hmm. Oh, my gosh. Audrey, this is... 
this is so much for you to handle. And I, my heart is just aching for what you had to go through. And I just have to say how incredibly brave and courageous and this warrior that you were to stand up for your daughters when we've done these interviews with other people whose mothers looked the other way, didn't believe their children. And I'm just so happy that your daughters had someone who stood up for them, who believed them, who took this whole church and said, yeah, I'm, I'm, I don't care what you say. I don't care what you try to do. I'm standing up for these girls. And it's just incredible. I just have to praise you for that. It's just so inspirational, the type of mother that you are to be willing to go through this hell. When as a teenager, I was not believed and punished. It took me, I was almost 40 before I realized that that was actually, that I was raped. And that was not consensual. <clears throat> and I swore I would never be like my mother. And I meant it. Yeah. And I had people tell me, oh, don't swear that you're not going to be like your mom because that's going to make you just like her. I am not my mother and I am proud of that. Yeah. It's been hell, but you don't hurt my babies and get away with it. And so the church continued, you know, through the whole process, we hit COVID. And so everything slowed down and court dates kept getting rescheduled and rescheduled and rescheduled. And there was the masking situation and the social distancing. And so all this time I'm being harassed. Oh. People are breaking into my home. They're stealing things. Someone, killed my daughter's cat. What? Um, just, People would stalk us, follow us around. I mean, we lived in constant terror. I went and got my concealed carry, and I was armed. I was armed all the time. My children, my my youngest son didn't sleep in his own bed for two and a half years because they would come in during the night and stand in my children's doorways and just stand there. Oh, my gosh. Or stand over their beds. And it was so much trauma. That is terrifying we were, we're far enough out that, you know, we're 25 minutes from precinct. So by the time the cops got here, we knew who it was. They would call children and youth on me and make up lies and say that I was doing drugs or, you know, that my children weren't safe and this, that, and the other thing. They desperately wanted to take my children from me. They tried everything they could think of. And it got to be where children and youth wouldn't even come out anymore because they knew it was, it was just another false alarm. And the police would pay visits to the people who they traced the phone numbers back. They knew exactly who it was. And um, it didn't stop until he was incarcerated. It was a long three years. Wow. Three years you had to deal with that. I look back sometimes and I don't even know how I survived it. Like it just, there's, there's large portions through my lifetime of memories that are just gone, that just aren't there. There's just holes. And then every once in a while, you know, something will pop up or someone will say something or remind me of something. I'll be, Oh yeah, that's right. Um, but it was just so much trauma. It was so much trauma. Like <sighs> just watching your daughters on sins of the Amish and the emotion and the pain that I can relate to is just, it's heartbreaking that they had to go through that. And I'm just, again, so glad that they had you to lean on and had you to support them. I can't imagine going to trial for something like that and how difficult that must have been for them. Were they forced to testify at all? How did the trial go? So in the end, again, I was between a rock and a hard place because we're still in COVID. We're still, you know, there's still the social distancing in place. and. The ADA was just like, you know, we can go to trial and we can very likely get a much greater sentence for him than the plea deal. But we run the risk because they'll have to wear a mask and a shield and everyone will be scattered or the jury will be scattered all in space all around the courtroom. She's like, we run the risk that the emotion will not come through. And she said, that's so important. And then 
combine that with the fact that these girls were going to have to go through all this trauma. And his dad hired the most expensive attorney in the state of Pennsylvania to defend him. And his attorney did not want to re represent him from the very beginning. He knew from the beginning, he told the state attorney the very first hearing, he's like, I know he did it. Wow. Can I have the evidence up front right now so I can try to talk some sense into my client? And they wouldn't stand down. They were determined to prove that he was innocent and that I was somehow a crazy, unhinged, revengeful wife who was trying to take the kids from him. And his attorney even said, he said, I don't want to have to do this to these girls. He said, you know, he was very, he's very good at what he does. And he said, if I have to, I will do my job. But he didn't want to. And I knew... I knew that if he wasn't found guilty, I, there would be no way to keep my children safe from him. And so I had a hard choice to make. Do I go with the plea deal and do a five to 20? Or do I run the risk of him getting what he should have had, which would have been more like 120? Yeah. Do I run the risk of not being able to keep my children safe? And so in the end, I agreed to go with the plea deal. And that was something that, you know, I, I also, you know, cause my, I asked my children, I said, what, what do you want? And, and they were like, obviously they just wanted to be safe. So, um, in the end, that's why we decided to go with the plea deal, but we, our judge, the judge was amazing and he was found to be a sexually violent predator. His, basically his whole family sat with him in a black and white row on the bench. And we were each given an opportunity to speak. And an opportunity to change our mind at the last minute if we still wanted to go to trial. The emotions, I don't really know how to describe those emotions because at that point, I just wanted it to be over. I just wanted to be safe. And yet watching my children try to process the cognitive dissonance of this is their dad that they loved and yet what he'd done to them, the atrocity of what he'd done to them was so hard to watch. And there wasn't even time for me to process the cognitive, cognitive dissonance that I had, having been married to someone who wasn't even who I thought he was. And that came much later for me. Yeah, you're in survival mode. Mm -hmm. It's not safe to process your emotions when you're just trying to keep yourself and your children safe. I'm grateful, so grateful that I have all of my children and that I can say all of my children are stable now and they love me to death. Because I know not every mom who tries to fight for her kids finds herself in that position. But the loss of family, of community, of support, of everything we've ever known is immeasurable. And I don't know how to explain to someone who doesn't, to hasn't been, who hasn't been there what it's like to have the perpetrator's whole family stand behind him and how deeply betraying and painful that is. I know what that's like. Because they don't want, they don't want the repercussions. Even if they know, even if they were one of his victims, they don't want the repercussions. They don't want the loss. So they choose denial and they choose silence. And victim blaming. And anyone can, anyone can victim blame. But when it's victims blaming victims, that's hard. It's hard to experience. And I see, I saw that a lot. Yeah. They couldn't process their own internal reality. So in turn, they were unable to process ours. Yeah, it's the cycle of trauma. And I want to get your opinion because I know a lot of people may be thinking this is an isolated incident. It's just one bad apple. Don't blame the whole Amish. But clearly it's this cycle. It's this pattern. It's people who are hurt hurting people. And so I'd like to get your opinion on why you think this is so rampant aside from what we've talked about, which is blaming the women for these things happening. It just seems like it's so prevalent in these cultures. And I just want to get your thoughts on why you think that's so. I think it's multifaceted. 
the fabric of the community itself is so flawed. You have a patriarchal culture where men are born entitled. There's no education other than what happens in the barn. When you have a power and control dynamic. The unequal power balance, right? Yeah, the the power and control wheel is so unbalanced and the women and the children don't have a voice. So they have no opportunity. There's no equality. And so when you have such such a power imbalance and so many people who have no voice, there's no way to change what is. What is continues. And these women have no resources, have no education, they have no way out. They don't even know that out is an option because if you go out, you go to hell. So it's better to stay because at least then you'll go to heaven. It's so broken. It's so broken. And the men just see women as objects for their own pleasure, for their own service. And the outside world romanticizes the culture. Yeah which in turn continues the dynamic. It protects it. Yeah. We'll just let them handle their problems on the inside. I can't tell you how often I've heard that from law enforcement. Well, they handle their problems on the inside. They don't cause any issues. So we don't see a need to stir up the water. And you have these helpless victims inside who don't even realize what's happening to them, who don't even realize they can cry for help, who can't even explain what it is that's happening to them because they have no vocabulary for it. They have no vocabulary and no context. And it's like a horror movie where they can't even scream. Wow. I'm so happy you got your family out of there and that they're safe and they're doing better now. Is there anything else that you want to talk about about this whole experience before we talk about how you're doing now and where you and your kids are at? I can't think of anything. Well, then I would love to know what brings you joy and peace and happiness. What is your consciousness side of the story? What brings you joy and happiness? So I'm happiest when I'm with my children, digging in the dirt, watching my flowers grow, riding my Harley. There's nothing like riding my Harley. Nothing like riding my Harley. Spending time with people that I love, creating connection. That's where I'm happiest. Oh, that's amazing. I love that you have a Harley. It's so opposite from the Amish that it just makes (laughs) me smile. (laughs) My mom's also a Harley lover. Oh, really? (laughs) Well... I named her Jezebel. Oh my gosh, that's so good. <laughs> that's so good. I've been called <laughs> I've been called Jezebel too many times to count. And guess what? I own it. Yes. Oh my gosh, I love that. Can you explain for people who don't know what that means? Jezebel in the re- the conservative religious culture would be considered a a whore. She represents witchcraft, rebellion, power and control, just all the horrible things you could think of, the most horrible things you could think of to describe a woman that they can't control. I don't know. I don't know how to explain No, (laughs) you did a great job. I love that. I just love the image of you taking control of Jezebel on this ride of freedom wherever you want. It's so awesome. I'm going to have to get a picture of it and put it on screen <laughs> so everyone can see. <laughs> I love that. So the, I have, I, I jokingly um, say that she's my broom <laughs> and I ride her in four inch heels. <laughs> yes, that's amazing. Oh, that's so good. That's so good. Is there anything that you're comfortable sharing or that your children wouldn't mind you sharing about how they're doing now? I can honestly say that my children are thriving. Obviously, trauma follows us for the rest of our lives. But we've they've been in therapy for years and continue to be. And each of them are very self-aware and are committed to their own personal growth. 
I know they will always carry pieces of what they've gone through, especially the betrayal by the family. That wounded them deeply and they won't, they won't darken a church house door and I don't blame them. Everything that was supposed to represent God to them was weaponized against them. But I can honestly say that I am very proud of them and very grateful for where they are and where they continue to go. It's a journey. Thank you so much for sharing all of that and going to those dark places with us and exposing these dark corners of the Amish world that you were a part of. It's so important to spread awareness. So maybe it reaches police enforcement and next time they hear of something, they actually go and investigate and they don't just leave them to their own devices. And maybe through this awareness, these small changes can happen and more victims and survivors can come forward and know that they have options. So I just really, really appreciate your time and willingness to share. Thank you for the opportunity. So before we go, it's time for our Linda Listen moment. Our little lighthearted, sassy statement, if you will, to someone who's pissed you off, or you can go an inspirational route, which, or you could do both. Whichever you want to do is great. I got one while you're thinking. Okay. My Linda listen to everyone in your circles or around you would be Linda listen. This mama dragon ain't backing down for nobody. So be careful how close you get because <laughs> if you come near her baby dragons, that <laughs> fire will be hot and you will be regretting every decision. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> Absolutely. Linda, listen, stop romanticizing the culture. Open your eyes and your ears because there's victims everywhere. Yeah. Victims who need your help, need your support, need your trust. They need to know that you're there for them and that you will believe them. Belief is one of the most important things for someone coming out of that culture. Nothing is too crazy. Nothing is impossible. Do you happen to know any resources for people who may be stumbling upon this and e either want to volunteer? I've gotten a lot of comments asking, how can I volunteer? I live close to an Amish community. I want to know how I can help if someone's trying to escape. Nonprofits or charities who work on helping to get people out or if you have suggestions for someone who sees someone who may need help and they don't know how to proceed or someone who is trying to escape themselves. Any any advice that you have or a direction I could point people would be great. So Trudy Metzger at Generations Unleashed. She's an excellent resource and has been working in this field with plain people for many years. And I always tell people they're more than welcome to reach out to me. And if I can't help them, I will try to point them in the direction that best suits their needs. Amazing. And I have your Facebook here and I'm going to put the links in the description, guys. But to find Audrey on Facebook, it's Audrey P. Malco Kaufman. So I'll add that below. And was there any other social media links that you'd like me to include? That's all right now. OK, great. Wow. This has been amazing. Thank you again. I know it takes a lot to come on and rehash all of those things and so i just appreciate you and um is there anything else that you want to add any final thoughts before we go i don't think so thank you you were very sensitive in you yeah i appreciate that thank you i'm so so glad to hear that i always do my best to make it a positive experience among the hard the difficult things that we talk about but i'm so happy to hear that for everyone watching, thank you for sticking around. Thank you for being here. Please leave some words of encouragement for Audrey down in the comment section below. It not only helps our guest, but it helps the algorithm. And if you'd like to support the podcast even further, you can become a patron at patreon.com slash cults to consciousness. 
I have new patrons that I'd like to give shout outs to Gemma, AK and Stephanie. Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. And if you like this episode, I'll link a few down here that you may want to check out. And until next time, follow your highest excitement, be conscious and be well.